Before I introduce our speaker, one last thing. We have next year's lineup. We don't have our formal uh, flyer out yet. We do have some, uh, one flyer in the back. Our first speaker is January 17, 2016. Another great speaker, Jerry Moe from the Betty Ford Center, speaking about understanding addiction and recovery through a child's eyes. He's been here once or twice before. Another fabulous speaker. As you're gonna see today, we get the best speakers in the country to come here. It's amazing. Uh, so mark your calendars. Uh, in January, I'll give you the rest of the schedule, which is all set already. Uh, but again, another slate of fantastic nationally known speakers in the field of addiction, which brings us to today's program. So let me introduce our speaker. Fred Lusk, Frederick Luskin founded and currently serves as director of the Stanford University Forgiveness Project. He is also senior consultant in health promotion at Stanford University Health Center and department chair in clinical psychology at Sophia University. At Stanford, Dr. Luskin teaches classes on the art of happiness, meditation, developing emotional intelligence, and the psychology of storytelling to undergraduate, undergraduate and graduate students. He also conducts numerous workshops and staff development trainings in his work for the Stanford Be Well Wellness Program. Dr. Luskin is the author of the best-selling book, Forgive for Good, A Proven Prescription for Health and Happiness, and Forgive for Love, The Missing Ingredient for a Healthy and Happy Relationship. His book, Forgive for Good, is the best-selling self-help book published on the topic of forgiveness. His research has shown that the Forgive for Good forgiveness methodology leads participants suffering from a wide range of concerns to improve physical and mental health. He is also the author of Stress Free for Good, 10 Scientifically Proven Life Skills for Health and Happiness, which emerged from his 10 years as a researcher in preventive cardiology at the Stanford University School of Medicine. His work showed the effect of enhancing stress management and positive emotion skills to help patients cope with congestive heart failure <clears throat> and arrhythmia. He also did some consulting work for Stanford Hospital nurses in managing their emotions. Dr. Luskin teaches stress management, emotional intelligence, and happiness skills to corporate clients throughout the United States. His work focuses on the research proven, research proven triad of a healthy and happy life, enhancing interpersonal relationships, creating a positive purpose in life, and guided practice and appreciation and other positive emotions. So it's with great pleasure. Welcome Dr. Fred Luskin. And he's from New York, like me. I am from, where are you from? Brooklyn. I'm from the Bronx. All right. <laughs> well, hi. I'm from the Bronx. And you know what I was thinking? I mean, here's the fancy introduction. And I walked up and I was thinking, I am so grateful that I can come to work in sweatpants. <laughs> That's honestly what I was thinking, that I could come straight from the gym and relax and show up and talk. Um, that's funny. Um, I, I'm going to talk and give you some practices for a couple of hours on um, things that have been shown to make people happier. Um, one thing that I will say, though, if you want to benefit from this, you will turn off your phones. Um, Probably at this point in our lives, one of the biggest obstacles to our happiness is the constant distractions that our nervous system takes as stress and danger. We may not recognize it as such, but whenever you're distracted or whenever you're in a hurry, your little pea brain in here is saying, oops, we have a problem, so you can't relax. And the constant distractions that we all have. You know, it was interesting. I was um, I was speaking at a, a hotel in the Los Angeles area, and the driver of the car taking me back to LAX. We were stuck in traffic. I mean, like that's unusual, but um, he was. He was telling me how much worse traffic has become since everybody has a cell phone all the time because nobody picks their head up so the traffic doesn't move even when it has an opportunity to move. Like this is from a car driver. It was a very interesting thing how our own, I mean it's a metaphor for happiness. 
It's how our own self-absorption impacts negatively the life of everyone else. So while it's perfectly okay and normal to be checking, you know, the Yankee scores while you're sitting there stuck in traffic, when everybody's checking the Yankee scores, then cars aren't moving ahead and the traffic gets worse. And what's so interesting is, to me, the very basis of most of our unhappiness, not all of it, is our self-absorption, is our staggering self-centeredness. And that contrasts with research that shows that community, relationships, goodwill, kindness, like, duh, those are the basis of happy people. And it's very, very, very hard to do that when you're constantly on this. Because the loop that gets created is so self-referential that it becomes harder to notice how other people are feeling. It becomes harder to empathize and it becomes harder to even, they're finding out, even see. Like we're losing some of our capacity to visually process because so much of our attention is just like quickly scanning. And so we're losing some ability to see people, to really see them, to recognize their moods, to read their body language. Our, our brain is still doing it but our conscious part of us is not. And since the brain is only processing the threat parts of other human beings, more and more we're missing the goodness that human beings have to bring. Because you can't, you can't do this all day long and stay attuned to other people. You just can't do it. So it's an enormous cultural experiment on whether we can live in a harried, distracted way and be happy. You know, whether we can have the brain alignment or chemistry or whatever you want to call it that allows happiness to emerge if you can do that in a hurry and distracted. My guess is probably not, at least for another maybe 100 generations till we evolve. But the way we are now, we're making it harder on ourselves. You know, and I saw it here the way I see it. I live right outside of San Francisco. I, I teach at Stanford. I saw it here. You slow down for a moment, 12 people are tense behind you honking. If you wanted a picture of an unhappy community, you couldn't get more clear than that. It's like right there, you see the, the, the anger and the anxiety that makes that normal. I can't wait. I can't sit still. I'm so entitled that, you know, I have to always be like, like anxious. I mean, it's, it's not any different on 101 outside of San Francisco, but it's a sign of a tremendous unhappiness of a culture, that that's normal, not like scorned, that we can't wait and we can't be gracious. Like, what is happiness? It's thinking, I'm fine. So why do I need anybody to suffer? I'm good. I can be gracious. Go ahead of me online. What do I care? My life's good. I'm good. Like, I like my life. If you like your life, you don't care if you have to wait five seconds sitting in your life. <laughs> well, but that's the simple truth. If you're always impatient, you don't like your life. You know, I remember thinking, um, Again, I, I've taught at Stanford for almost 25 years and have lived right around there and watched it. And of course, the dreaded words for there are, please don't let us become Los Angeles. 
I'm just saying, that is like this, you know what I mean? It, like, no, keep the curse away. Um, but I remember one Thanksgiving, not that long ago, um, going into the Whole Foods, I don't know, three miles from Stanford, and it was the day before Thanksgiving. And so everybody was as tense as can be because the next day they're going to show how grateful they are. <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't us, it would be hilarious. But you see all these people like tensely gripping their carts and rushing around like lunatics because they're late and in a hurry to make the meal that they're going to show gratitude about. And, you know, they converge <laughs> and they argue with their carts, you know, and, the, and then you watch people on the express line counting the number of items that the people ahead of them have. And you think to yourself, if you're thinking, boy, what unhappy people. Like really unhappy people. Could you be less gracious if you can afford Whole Foods? <laughs> right, well, that's a big if. You know, they have, I know they have bankers out front with lines of credit, you know, just before you walk into Whole Foods. Whole paycheck, it's called, whole prices. It's absurd. I mean, it, there's some level this is all so absurd. But if you can afford Whole Foods and you can't wait, you've missed a lot. And if you can't be gracious, that's the interesting thing. It's the graciousness that's missing. Just, of course, go ahead. It's Thanksgiving. If I'm, not, if I'm an asshole today, like the day before Thanksgiving, that's a pretty good bet I'm an asshole most of the 365 <laughs> other days. You know, I mean, I would take odds on that, you know, 10 to 1. If you can't be pleasant on Thanksgiving, like, just it's time to pack it in. But what an interesting indication of how unhappy everyone is. Because they can't sit, and they can't wait, and they're not gracious. They're just not gracious. Like what, I mean, again, what else would happiness be, if you think about it? It's like, wow, of course, I like my life. I mean, this is the essence of it. I like my life. So there's nothing I have to fight about all the time in traffic or at Whole Foods or on the post office or whatever it is. Why would I have to fight if I liked my life? What, what am I fighting for? I already have it if I'm happier. It's only unhappy people who can't chill. I mean, I, I, remember, I remember thinking that you know, all the times that I remember how this applies to me, because I'll find myself sitting on 101 in the, the seven minute delay that they now have between where I live in Palo Alto, and half the time I'm fine, and there's a percentage of time where I am just not pleased, because His Royal Highness has to wait seven minutes. Right? I mean, think about that. That's all it is. This Royal Highness. And, and so there are moments when I'll just look at myself and say, wow, you are not doing whatever it really requires to be a happy person. You're just not doing the work. You're, you're not, what would be the word? You're not, I guess you're not smelling the coffee, right? Or whatever it is you're supposed to smell. But it takes a certain kind of work to be happy. But it also takes, and, and this is fundamental, a certain kind of honesty with yourself. Like, am I an impatient 
narcissist or not. I mean, at, at some level, that's the difficult question to ask yourself. Am I generally nice when I don't have to be? You know, like these are the questions of happiness. Like, and, and, and I remember the first time that I recognized in myself, like, anger when I was stuck in traffic because of an accident. Like in myself, I recognized, Fred, you're not happy with this. Cause it, and, and then I realized that somebody could have died and I'm worrying about me waiting a few minutes. Like how much uglier does it get than that? But it's all this staggering self-absorption. Like almost, almost oppressive, like, all that matters is me. And, and that's the alternative to happiness. I mean, what's so interesting is that basically all the spiritual traditions got it right. You've got to a little bit transcend yourself. You've got to think of others. You've got to appreciate others. And you've got to slow the selfishness down just a little bit. You know, the interesting piece about research is that people who are like in this desperate quest for their own happiness don't find it, which is very interesting. So like if you wake up in the morning and think, okay, I'm, these are the 1,400 things I'm going to do today to make myself happy you not get happy from it. It's like, well, I need a massage. Then I need 101 to be empty. Th then I need the perfect lunch. Then I need this person to be nice to me. Then I need to congratulate myself for being such a wonderful person. <laughs> then I need this, 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 this. It doesn't work. That's not how you get happiness. I mean, it, it's one attempt. Let me, let me start with a practice, and, and there's all sorts of positive psychology practices by people who have studied this a bit, but they're all so simple, and all of you know how to do it. That's what's so wonderful about it. You all know all this stuff. I can, I'm not teaching you anything, which makes it easier on me, because I don't have to know anything. But here's what I'd like you to do just to start, is turn to somebody near you and just begin a conversation by asking them, what is going well for you today? <laughs> and wait, I'm not done with the instructions. Hold on, give me a second. <laughs> you know, I, I had an entertaining moment's thought that instead of having to hire a speaker, they could just like bring everybody in and tell you to talk to each other. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I remember when I was teaching at Esalen one time, this was years ago, um, I, I, I was teaching forgiveness and, and people love to tell their stories about how badly they've been treated. Um, oh, they just love it. So. I gave like an assignment to tell your story and then they wouldn't stop. <laughs> so I felt like, okay, I'll go. I'll go sit in the hot tub and you can go tell your story. <laughs> um, the practice that I just gave is actually one of the more demanding practices in life. And, and I, 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 I don't mean to exaggerate that or make that sound so pompous, but it is very hard for human beings to talk about the good. It is very, very, very hard. Human beings' brains, many of you know, come with a profound negativity bias. We're wired for survival, not to be happy. 
So whatever your most primitive parts of your nervous system is all it wants to make sure is that you get to tomorrow. It doesn't care how. So you could be this wretched, quibbling mess sitting there watching the news all day on TV, and it doesn't care as long as you get to tomorrow. In order to do that, it makes you hyper-vigilant for anything that can possibly go wrong, anything. And not only does it make you hyper-vigilant, it makes you wildly inaccurate. No, seriously, it's, it's like your basic priming is mostly wrong. And it's designed that way so that you err all the time for caution, for exaggerated threat, and for safety, all the time. And then nature has given us a left hemisphere of the brain whose part is to create language around all these threats. And we do, we weave all these stories about how hard our life has been and how challenging it is and how difficult. And here, it's so funny to me, here we are all so wealthy. And yet we weave these stories as if we're in some desperate fight for our survival by going to work. This is the way our mind and brain were designed to make sure that we don't get too happy because back in the day, if you were happy, you'd get eaten. <laughs> I mean, that, that's basically it. In, in way back in the day, because the evolutionary biologists talk about how we're the descendants of anxious apes. That's that the most anxious apes are the ones that passed on their genes. And so the chill apes, you know, like they're just sitting there enjoying a banana or something like that, you know what I mean? And they're gone. <laughs> yeah, they're long gone. But the anxious apes who are vigilantly staring and checking everything out and making sure of this and checking it again and sticking, looking under this and, and thinking, well, there's a problem out there. Those apes became us. So we are riddled with anxiety, all of us, riddled with it. And anxious is the human default. It is. It's, 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 the, it's what we go back to if we're not careful and we don't practice relaxation and we don't practice ways of becoming more positive, you will just be your anxious self. You'll worry. And you'll worry and worry and you'll hurry all the time. Because anxious people hurry all over the place. They just hurry. And anxious people multitask because there's so much to do. And you don't want to miss an episode of a soap opera, you know what I mean? <laughs> There's so much to do. And the anxiety that we feel, most of it is just programmed. It's not even personal. But in order to work against that, you actually have to quiet down. You have to. And you have to practice being safe in the world. One of the ways you practice being safe in the world, and that's why that exercise is so hard, is one of the ways we practice being safe in the world is by talking about what's good, not what's bad. The research is most of us spend between 75 and 80 percent of our day complaining. That's what the research shows. I've met people who are better at it than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was married to one once. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's giving a talk somewhere else saying the same thing, you know? It's like, 
I was married to this guy who was anxious 92% of the time or whatever. But there is some research that we tend to complain all the time. That's what's so hard about that practice. Because most of us, when we're asked to say, well, what's good about our day? We'll say, well, I had a nice morning. And then we'll go, but it was a little cloudier than I would have liked. <laughs> and there was a little more traffic than I would prefer. And then the mind and its phenomenal ability to find problems everywhere then says, well, you know, there's always a lot of traffic. And that reminds me, I need my car cleaned. And then, you know, I don't trust the guy down the corner who does the car cleaning. And then two years ago, when I got my car cleaned, they nicked it. And because that's the way your mind works. That's the way all of our minds work, one problem after another. And so you have to practice what I would refer to as some combination. Gratitude's not enough. I, I've been understanding that there's a lot of people who do gratitude practices. And some of them just feed the ego, and some of them are true gratitude. But a lot of people, their gratitude is, I'm simply happy because I'm so wonderful. That's yeah, true. Like, aren't I great that I have this great job or anything like that? That's fine. But that doesn't quiet the body and the mind. What's real gratitude is some humility along with gratitude and some awe, which is how did I get this lucky? Not, I'm grateful for all that I have. How did I get this lucky? I know I didn't really do anything. I mean, much of whatever we, much of what most people have is an accident of birth. You know, the, the research on class mobility is most people don't move that much. Now, there could be karmic forces. I, I, can't, I can't speak not for that. But one of the ways that you can practice a kind of humble gratitude is by talking about what went well without you being in the center of it every second. And that, that involves noticing other people and seeing beauty and, and appreciating like, even the opportunity to answer the question. Like, it's just what an opportunity that is. I mean, there, there are many, many, many places in the world where they could never sit in a room like this. You know, there would be no room like this, or the room wouldn't be safe and they wouldn't have food just right there, and they probably wouldn't, may not even have running water. And so just being in a room like this, able to ask that question, is a profound abundance, right? I mean, you understand? I hope you see what I'm trying to say. It's, it's a complicated depth thing of what you look for and at. So it involves some quiet, a little bit of quiet, a little bit of making sure you breathe a little slower so you practice safety. Safety. And you can never feel safe unless you can relax quietly sitting by yourself. It's impossible. You have to have access to that part of you. You, have, you can't do it otherwise. So I'm going to give you one more practice, and then I'm going to do a meditation. I'm going to give you one more practice of speaking positively. So let me, let me make the, give you the instructions. One, 
Think of someone in your life that you really like, some person. Don't make that person you. <laughs> I know for many of you, that's, that's all you got. But uh, <laughs> so you won't, you'll just have to sit this one out. Um, but maybe you like a dog or something if there's no people. Um, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of a person that you really like. And I want you to th contemplate their good qualities, which we almost never do. Almost never. We complain a lot about people, but very, very, very rarely say really nice things about people. So what I would like you to do is contemplate their good qualities and the blessings they offer and whatever else you can think of to describe it. You know, what you've learned from them and how you've grown and how they've helped you and what you appreciate and just a positive conversation. And the key to this conversation is that neither person will say anything negative which is hard, but it's a phenomenal practice for happiness. Not that you have to be some kind of bliss ninny doing this all the time, but you have to be able to do it. You have to be able to shut off that critic in there that is so hostile. You need to be able to shut that down for a while. And the only way you get to do that is by practicing. It doesn't happen by accident. You have to practice. And when you shut down that part of you that is self-centered and critical, even for a moment, your blood pressure goes down, your muscles relax, because you feel safe. You're talking about a good world. You're talking about people, that, someone that you like. So you're your mind that is addicted to negativity gets a break. Because you, whatever it is the you is that chooses, is choosing to go in a different channel. Like right now, for the next five or seven minutes, I'm going to live in a safe world. That world has nothing for me to complain about, nothing for me to argue with. I'm just going to talk about somebody I really like. Now, for almost all of us, after like a minute of it, it starts to feel ridiculous. <laughs> it does. Like, what the hell am I doing here? I've already said I like you. Now go away. <laughs> it's, it's good work to work with your own nervous system and help it align into a more benign and safe reality. Because the truth is, you live in an extremely dangerous world, which is true, and an extremely benign world, which is also true. They're both true. Just true. They're just both true. So please find a partner, have a conversation about someone you like that's not you, and both of you talk only positively about someone for a five, six minutes. Thank you. You know, when we think about happiness, one of the really simple things that we don't think about is our own words and what we talk about. I remember decades ago when I was being trained as a therapist, it always struck me as bizarre that people just came in and complained to me about their lives. <laughs> well, first I wondered why anybody would want to do that for a living, like sitting in a little room with people complaining about their lives. But, <laughs> but more deeply than that, like, I had a sense that I was on the wrong side of something. 
that instead of teaching people directly like how to be happier, I, w I was taught nothing about that, nothing. But I could have like gone like this and said, okay, enough. You've been seeing me for 17 weeks. You've never said one nice thing about your life. Something's way out of whack here. <laughs> like, there's something wrong with you, and there's something wrong with me. Like, for you for saying it, and me for listening to it. <laughs> I thought, I want to help you. How can I help you if you're just complaining all the time? So let's stop. And let's figure out what we can say good right now. Because if we can't get access to the part, that part of the brain, what am I doing with somebody? But it's the same for all of us. Like, what are, what are we doing? It, it's a very interesting thing. Possibly if we lived forever, it would make sense for us all to be so distracted by things that are wrong and problems and all the things we allow to occupy our attention. But it's a short life. Like you don't know how long you get. And we all act as if somehow we have this endless amount of time and not quiet down enough to see what a beautiful privilege it is to be here for the time that we're here. It's just a privilege. And the only way we can do that is to quiet. Like to, to, it's a meditative thing. It's a quiet so that your mind and body can even receive the signals of this world. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a break in a minute, but let me, before that, I want to do a meditation practice. And, and just to, to quiet you and me. So if you'd all like sit reasonably comfortably in your chair with your eyes closed. And for this meditation, if, you, if your legs are crossed at the thigh, would you please uncross them? Because it makes it much harder to fully breathe into and out of your abdomen. And then one of the things that makes breathing into and out of your abdomen so much easier is if you relax your shoulders. So what I'd like you to do is rotate your shoulders forward and back. Just gently rotate them forward and rotate them back, gently. And then raise them up and let them fall. And raise them up and let them fall. And raise them up and let them fall. And then pull back on your shoulders. Just tense a little bit, pull back, and then relax. And then if you do that, your shoulders will be quieter. And so your belly is more capable of breathing in a way that suggests you're safe. This is the key piece of this. Can you create conditions where you're safe so that you don't have to be adrenalized? So you can just be with yourself. So what I'd like you to do is see if you can just quiet your breathing down just a tiny bit by deepening it. Deepening your breathing a little, quieting it a little. And that means slowing your breathing. And allowing your belly to expand when you inhale is the key practice. And this is just the simplest abdominal breathing.
what we what we just don't do enough of is quieting down through the connection with either our own abundance or our own safety or our own capacity to love. And by not doing that, our nervous systems are so easily jangled, and mine is too, all the time. And a jangled nervous system is under threat. And what, what happiness is, is some experience that I can handle my, the threats that are coming in my life. Like, I, I don't have to be so worried. But we have to practice. It's, I, I, I do trainings in the corporate world pretty regularly. And, and one of the simplest reminders for them, because usually when we do a training, it's, um, you know, the people will bring lots of food in, the, the companies. And, and the simplest reminder is, like, just look at how lucky you are that you work in a place where they could, like, overfeed you, which is what happens. I work for one place where, and I've made fun of this, it's a consulting group, and these people work all the time, and they travel, and they work like 14-hour days. And so I kid them and say, well, you know, I, the company hires me, and we do some trainings, and I say, like, they give them breakfast, like, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Then they give them a snack at 10. Then there's lunch at 12. Then there's another snack at 2. Then there's, like, a nicer snack at, like, 5. And then there's dinner. And so what I kid them is, like, they know you're so busy that this is the only chance you'll have to eat. <laughs> but... We're, we're, we're almost all too adrenalized to even recognize how exquisitely lucky we are to have food. And because of that, because we don't see it, the stories we tell about our lives are basically dishonest. And, and that was another significant and horrifying complaint I used to have about my profession of, of therapy. You know, here we are treating, I mean, I'm not saying all people who come to therapists, but I, I was, treat, you know, I was seeing all these middle class people. And, you know, they would tell me how tough it is. And I think, well, you have running water and food and shelter and your kids get a good education, and you have transportation and education, what's so tough? Like, and I'm not saying life is easy, but just by waking up where you are, you're better off than 80% of the world. But we had myths from psychotherapy even about how rugged things are, which is all just threat. Now, None of this says that you deny life's difficulties because they're omnipresent. What, what happiness is is a buffer so you don't get swallowed up by life's difficulties. It's like it's creating a, a, a different channel in the nervous system to keep the difficulties into perspective, not to deny them. What unhappy people do is they deny life's goodness. And that's, that's what they do that is so harmful. And that's where I entered into the world of positive psychology before there was a world of positive psychology. Because I just thought, this is just flat out wrong. I mean, to give people a chance, you want to level the playing field. So yes, this stunk, but this was good. But we want to do that ourselves. Anyway, time for a break. I'll come back in about 10, 15 minutes, and then I'll do a little more. Thank you. Just a reminder, our next, you'll, you'll get email, but January, uh, I forgot. Oh, January 17th, we have Jerry Moe speaking as well. So mark your calendars. Another full house that day, I'm sure. 
So we've been doing this, as I said, these frontiers in addiction for many, many years. We're proud and pleased to have the Meadows as our uh, co-host and partners in these programs for both 2016 and 2017 as well. So please give a few minutes to Cheryl Camby from the Meadows. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galbart. Hello, thank you all for being here. We're so excited that there is a full house for our very last event of the year. Um, my name is Cheryl Cambe. I'm with the Meadows. I'm the local Los Angeles based representative. Um, we're really excited to be co hosting this event, um, this lecture series again in 2017. So please keep up to date with us on what we have in store for you next year. The Meadows is a treatment center in Wickenburg, Arizona. We are a level one inpatient psychiatric facility. We've been around 40 years treating trauma, is our specialty. Inpatient level of care as well as residential treatment center. Um, at the Meadows, we do treat trauma, addiction, co uh, codependency, co-occurring disorders, including dual diagnosis, and straight mental health. They don't have to have, our clients don't have to have a, an addiction to come to us. Um, our book of programs also includes Remuda Ranch at the Meadows, which is an inpatient uh, facility for women and young girls treatment. Um, Remuda, Remuda has been around almost 25 years, um, so we are um, happy to be doing eating disorders now in the Meadows uh, Behavioral Health System, which wasn't happening before. Uh, Gentle Path at the Meadows is our men's inpatient sex addiction program. Sex addiction and trauma is our specialty there. It's a standalone facility. And then um, Claudia Black, I hope maybe a lot of you got to see her here in January to kick off the new year um, for the Frontiers in, of Addiction lecture series. She um, developed our young adult program inpatient ages 18 to 26. Outside of our inpatient programs we also have 17 different five-day intensive workshops at the Rio Retreat Center so um, we do have offerings for clients that aren't as acute as our inpatient clients and um, we also have an outpatient center which is located in Scottsdale Arizona for clients that are local to the to that area as well as clients that are leaving our inpatient programs our um, consultation group our senior fellows does include Claudia Black Dr. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk Peter Levine Dr. P uh, Patrick Carnes, um, Claudia Black, who I already mentioned, and um, many others. A couple of them will be speaking next year. So thank you for being here. Um, again, we're loving seeing a full house, and we'll see that again in January. So come early, because a lot of people didn't get seats, I think. But thank you again for having us here. Thanks, Dr. Gilbert, for great, Great treatment program. So let's welcome Dr. Luskin again. Well, hello again. Um, let me ask you to just reflect for a minute on if you look at the last, you know, couple of days of your life, who's been kind to you? Just reflect upon it. Just let your mind wander on kindness. We don't do this, partly because we're all in such a hurry, and partly because we're all self-absorbed, so we don't think about kindness because it's all coming to us. And partly just we're biologically predisposed to be curmudgeons. <laughs> but just let your mind wander over the last whatever and really think about who's been kind to you. It immediately quiets you down lowers your blood pressure, and opens your brain to the parts of your brain that can do positive problem solving. Like, we don't recognize that so much of our problem solving is just that. It's around problems. But there's so much else in life that we can investigate. 
besides just problems? Like, what do I want to contribute? And how do I appreciate this ridiculous monstrosity and mystery of life? And, and who can I help? And what's, what's my deepest truth? And how would I be creative? And all these other questions that you want to ask that we don't ask enough of because we're too busy with survival. But who's been kind to me? These are the kind of things you want to talk about if you want to be a happier person. Like you want to have these conversations with people. Like what goodness have you seen? And even maybe once every blue moon, what goodness have you done? You know, it's a very, it's a very interesting thing they did some research on like, who were the happier people in a whole range of communities all over the world. And this is so duh. The people who were happier, <laughs> they made happiness a goal. That's what distinguished them from the less happy people. They woke up in the morning and said, God, I'd like to be happy. So they were. <laughs> it's very interesting. I mean, psychologists refer to that as intention and try to make it sound fancier than it is. <clears throat> but the one thing that they have understood is that whatever it is we have this quality of intention, it's what forms our attention. So we pay attention to that which is of interest to us. So happier people, this is what's, again, another one of those things about psychotherapy that used to really frustrate me is, like when I would see a patient, what I'd see was the, the last, not maybe not the last step, but a chain of terrible decisions just terrible life decisions, even little life decisions, like let me ignore this. Nope, I'm not going to ignore it. I'm going to pay attention. Let me notice the sunset. Nope, I'm going to ignore it to complain. Little decisions all day long. Let me give thanks if somebody like treated me to dinner. Nope, I have a story about how bad my life is. I can't give this stuff up. So it's constant decisions. But the thing is, and, and one of the really interesting things about psychotherapy research, is, is therapists don't know that much about what it is that makes their clients change. You know, they, 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 they do interviews of both sides, and the therapist will often say, well, I did this brilliant intervention back then. You know, I planned it for weeks, and I was just waiting for the right moment to, like, jump ahead like super therapist. And then the client will say, well, you know, I noticed when they picked their nose, they were not self-conscious. So I figured if they can pick their nose without self-consciousness, so can I. Because there is yet no script for how to get people to go from the switch, which is life isn't good enough, to the switch, life is good enough. That's the most basic switch we have. And from that switch, from that decision, most of the decisions flow. So when and if any of us makes a decision that life is good enough, or I'm good enough, then hundreds of decisions come after that, which is sometimes even traffic is good enough, or the lines at Whole Foods, or whatever else life brings. It depends on that very basic decision what we 
pay attention to and then what we bring into the world as our conversation. You know, I there's, there's so much to this basic decision of am I okay or am I not okay? Am I safe or not safe? And is my life, has it been good enough or not? It's just a decision because there's no right answer. There, there is no objective standard of a good enough life or a good enough person. So we all are in the middle of that decision-making process. Forgiveness is, to some degree, a decision that my life was good enough so that I don't have to hold on to all this hostility to explain why I'm not happy enough. Because that's all unforgiveness is. It's you hold on to this stuff to explain why you're not happy. Well, I'm not happy because my mother didn't love me, or I'm not happy because my ex-husband from hell, like, you know, was an ex-husband from hell. Or Hades, or whatever, <laughs> wherever the ex-husbands are. More, the reason I say ex-husband is about 85% of people who attend forgiveness work are female. And it's some places it's higher, but somebody did an analysis of all the studies ever done on forgiveness, and the participants were like 85% women. And so that's been my experience. Sometimes it's more than that. And so the number one thing that people come to forgiveness work is bad ex-husbands. Second is bad current husbands. <laughs> Third is bad future husbands. <laughs> I'm just saying, in that order, those are the three catchments. There's really nothing in second place um, <laughs> except that. Well, it doesn't have to be husbands. It can be partners. You know, it doesn't. It's not the the, the relationship. But it's a decision about whether you want to be happy. Or you can't be blissful. Everybody has a set point which is biologically determined. It's just like, um, no matter how much I might want to, I will never play basketball like Michael Jordan. I could want to till the cows come home. I can't. So we all have biology that works against us or for us. Within that biology, we can maximize or minimize what's available to us. We have a bandwidth. So my basketball bandwidth doesn't include Michael Jordan's basketball bandwidth. My happiness bandwidth probably does not include like the truly happiest people. I'm a professor, like I'm, I think. Like I, I go inside of things sometimes too much. But I can maximize that piece of what's available to me through my decision, is it good enough or not? Was the life I had good enough? If it wasn't, then there's lots of things I need to blame. Right? Can't be me. Can't be me. So it's got to be something else. But that's the basic decision that nobody fully knows how to flick. In the psychotherapy literature, they are pretty clear that psychotherapy works, that techniques matter pretty little, and that the, the way the therapist encourages the client is the second most important quality for the success of therapy. The first is the willingness of the client. Like that's by far and away the largest part of the variance. The second is, does the therapist inspire hope? Do they model caring? And do they seem to have some expertise which they use in the service of the client's goals? That's what the therapist brings. Techniques very secondary. 
But the most important piece is the client open and willing to hear and listen. And if they are, and the therapist is inspiring, there's a hit. Now, the more inspiring the therapist is, the more hits, and the more open the client is, the narrower the quality of the therapist needs to be to make the match. So it's two bandwidths. But it's always like that, the, you know, Prochaska and de Clement stages of readiness. Are you ready? So most of what I teach the happiness class at Stanford have for the last seven years, most of it is asking the question is, are you ready? Yeah. Was your life good enough up to this point to be willing to say, okay, it's good enough. It's not perfect. I'm not perfect. It can't be perfect. It'll never be perfect. I'll never get everything I want. I don't even know what I want. How can I get it all? I mean, that's the <laughs> truth, too. We don't even know what we're doing. But was it good enough? Can I forgive the parts that weren't so good? And can I open a little more to the abundance that's waiting for me? Just a little more. Can I do that? I mean, that's, that's the question of whatever happiness is. You know, the, the biggest obstacle to that, not, not the, the biggest, but one of the huge obstacles besides our brain wired for negativity, the biggest obstacle is our culture. Every culture gets in the way of people's happiness, every one. Because cultures want like a, a middle, a mediocrity, so that they can control it or have a shared vision. Well, you can't do that with people on the ends. So Maslow's research was, you know, Abraham Maslow, that the people who were self actualized was about 2% of the population. You know, the people who, and, and one of the defining characteristics of their self-actualization was they were acultural, no matter where it was. That they weren't anti-cultural, they were acultural. Meaning, like they didn't give a shit what people thought, basically, but they weren't antagonistic in any way. Like they just did their thing to the best that they could do their thing. But they didn't criticize and they didn't fight and they weren't antagonistic. They just, they did their dance. That's hard to do. Because most of us and our brains are so wired for social acceptance that we're willing to be unhappy for it. It's true. That's the sacrifice most of us make culturally. We're willing to be less happy to share. You know, one of the things in our culture, I mean, the, the greater like, American culture, is, and it, and it relates to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which most of you know, like that little pyramid up here of self-actualization, and at the bottom, you know, the basic biological needs, what's so interesting about that pyramid is, I mean, Maslow knew that this at the top was rare and was hard to get to because you had all these other competing things that you had to have some satisfaction of before you could get up there. But what was so interesting in the way I think of it now is that the bottom two needs, the lowest one, is basic physiologic needs, such as you know, food, clothing, water, sex, um, you know, just the basic survival stuff. And then that, that's the biggest. You know? And so if you don't have any water, you're not going to stop and admire a Van Gogh for very long. <laughs> right? you, tr you may try to drink the paint off it, <laughs> but you're not going to admire it. Then, after the basic physiologic needs are the safety needs. 
which means that you can get your physiologic needs met whenever you need to. That's what the safety needs are. So you can have a refrigerator, basically, which is different than scrounging for food. And then even more than that, you have Whole Foods nearby. <laughs> and then even more than that, you have money in the bank so you can go to Whole Foods twice a year. You know what I mean? It's like. <laughs> but those are the basic safety needs to guarantee that your physiologic needs are met over and over. And we live in a culture, because it's consumer oriented, that wants you to believe that those two needs are the only ones that exist and that you can never get them met. That it does everything in its power to, to hallucinate together with you that a trip to France is better than a trip to Boca Raton. Because the obviousness of that is that people from France go someplace else to vacation. If you just think about, like, people from Hawaii go someplace else. <laughs> so it's not the spot. Right? I mean, think about that. When I, I remember being in Bali, and, uh, you know, I was at this beautiful place, and it was right on the Indian Ocean. But I was watching the waves come in. And, uh, you know, it's this, like, tropical, warm... But, I, but I, then I, I reflected to myself and I said, you know, well, Fred, the Buddha and the people who invented yoga, like they all lived in this kind of tropical thing and they touched the basic misery of life, which has nothing to do with whether it's warm or you have waves. It's that we all face the same predicaments but our culture has tried to answer that is that you can buy your way out of deep problems with surface solutions. That you can get these basic needs met in more and more kind of demented ways and that somehow that's going to make you more happy even though it actually makes you less happy because it's stalling your ascent up Maslow's hierarchy. So basically, if you have a nice house, almost no happiness is gained from having a nicer house. There's nothing wrong with it, it just doesn't contribute much to happiness. But thinking that you need the nicer house keeps you very occupied at lower levels of satisfaction and reduces the amount of time we can spend with the higher order needs, which are for people, for doing good things, for recognizing beauty and learning, and for affirming our unique place in this universe. Those are the higher order needs. They can never be affirmed by buying a Tesla, no matter how nice a Tesla might be, because you're just having a thing that's purchasable. But the, the need, the, the, from the safety to the belonging needs, that's the different, that's the, bottom, that's the dividing line. And what we have tried to do as a culture is co-opt the higher needs with these lower needs. So just buy this. Just have this experience. Rather than just have this experience. They just go outside and let the sun hit you or savor a strawberry. It's cheap. Unless, of course, you bought the strawberry at Whole Foods. Because <laughs> <laughs> then it will be extremely expensive. No, but, but the, the whole co-opting of happiness to just purchase and have, and even the same thing with ambition. There's no evidence that people at, unless you have very little, but that people at jobs that necessarily pay more are happier or that have more status. There's no, there's no, there's no evidence around that. 
the evidence is to some degree, well, there is a confluence between the need to self-actualize and some people are designed to be more in charge, to have more responsibility. That's just the way they're wired. And other people are designed to not want responsibility and let the world go by in its own pace. But the, the, the question is always, what do I want? Do I want to be happy? What do I want? Like, what do I want this afternoon? Like that, that's, that's unfortunately what it becomes. So if you make a bigger decision, such as, let's say, I'd like to get along better with people. Just a big decision like that towards happiness. Because right above the basic safety needs are the belonging needs, people. And the research is that people are the highest aspect, they weigh the most in terms of happiness by far. You know, that Harvard study that many of you have seen, the TED Talk and stuff, where they for about 80 years or 75 years, <clears throat> they've been tracking both the original f people who went to Harvard and then their, their descendants. After 75 or 80 years, the basic conclusion of the research was happiness depends on being able to love and receive love. And that's what it depends upon. Because we have to understand that cultures all over the world have less materially than we do. The ones that have too little materially, they're not happy people. It's very hard when you don't have enough food, clothing, shelter, safety for your kids, education for your kids. It's very hard. But when you have the basics, it doesn't add that much. The only place it comes into play is when your culture is ruthless around material things having to do with the status in a community. And then in order to fit in, we sacrifice some of our well-being to do that. You know, I remember reading, and I don't remember what the article was, um, that the average kitchen remodel had hit some ridiculous number. Like the average, like when, it, when a family remodeled its kitchen, it was like $60,000 or $50,000 on average in the United States. And I, and, I, and I thought to myself, I remembered, I mean, you can't do that now, but my parents bought their house for $12,000, right? I mean, they could have bought five kitchens, you know? <laughs> but that's how seduced we are. The average home in the United States in 1970-something was 1,500 square feet, 1,400 square feet. It's now 2,300 square feet on average, the average new home. We have multiplied our needs and wants in a constant seduction that it's going to make us happy when the evidence is reasonably simple. And this is, I'm going to talk for about another 10 minutes or so, and then I'm going to stop, and I will stay up here if anybody wants to come up and ask me a personal question or talk to me, because I'm going to be done at 11.30. Um, the evidence is pretty clear. The three things that contribute most to happiness is one, people. Do you pay enough attention to the people in your world? Do you appreciate people? Are you kind? Like, do you have a beneficent way? Like, that's first. Second is, do you have a decent purpose in the world? Like, this is so simple, and again, all the religious traditions push this since time immemorial get along with each other, do something of value. And the third piece is savor what you have, not what you don't have. Savor what you have. 
like may, and and these are these are the qualities that allow us to realign our nervous systems away from threat. You know, one of the interesting research that's coming out now is how affluence leads to a lack of empathy, an actual decrease in empathy. That, that there, there's research coming up to show this, which is fascinating. The simplest one was um, UC Berkeley people did a study in San Francisco, <coughs> excuse me, where they put a researcher in a crosswalk and they just had them walk across the street and another researcher just charted which cars stopped and which cars didn't and which car killed the person, you know what I mean? <laughs> so they knew who to send the bill to for the funeral. But they literally charted this cars and the interesting conclusion was it was a linear relationship between the expense of the car and how often it stopped. That the cheaper the car, the more likely it was. Now, you could say that the cheaper car, they, would, they, probably, they might not have even had brakes, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> but the more expensive the car, the more likely it was that it wouldn't stop. That research has been duplicated in other domains. The other thing that they've shown even is in, um, what am I thinking? In games where psychologists will give people like mock things to do and then they give people resources. The more resources that people get in the game, the less empathic they are to the other players. Because one of the things that happens is this. When you don't have a massive amount of resources, human beings tend to rely on each other, which makes you happier. When you have a lot of resources, people tend to rely on those resources, not on people. So they isolate themselves from other people. They don't depend on them, and they don't set up mutual um, usefulness needs because the money does that. The second thing, and this is more pernicious than most of us would like to admit because it affects us all. When you have a lot of resources in a world which doesn't, you have to come up with an explanation for that in your own head. You have to explain to yourself why you have so much and others don't. What most people do is find some kind of explanation that makes them deserved or better or worthy, and people who don't, not so worthy, not so deserving. They can use, the, there's the meritocracy reason. Well, I got more education, I went to school, I did this. Or there's the like moral reason. Well, you know, usually, usually good people get ahead and bad don't. But we come up with explanations, the wealthier you are, you have to come up with an explanation that examines why it is you have more and why you're not sharing. You have to come up with something. Like why you're choosing to take a trip when there's people starving. Like we all have to think about this. So we come up with explanations that distance ourselves from those who are in suffering to not, not be so invested. These are all qualities that make you less happy. You know, because empathy and caring make you happy. Living in a gated community, it, it's perfectly nice, but that attitude is not one that's going to make one gracious. You know, I understand the safety value of it, but you have to look behind that. And so what is really needed for us to be happy literally, is to have enough of a sense of our own decent life so that we can then share. And in order to get that decent life, we need to be able to like, appreciate what we have and forgive what we didn't. Okay. Let me finish with a meditation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and this is where I really wanted to stop with. And then again, if you want to come up and see me one at a time,
please feel free. Otherwise, I want this to end with a meditation practice. It's going to be a five-minute practice, so please allow your eyes to close. Very gently allow your eyes to close. Quiet your shoulders, relax them. And, and make an intention of quieting down. Just make an intention of quieting down. And what that intention means is that you, you can tell yourself that I'm so safe and so loved and so lucky that I can sit in this room and really have nothing to worry about for a couple of hours. There's nothing, nothing's going to happen. And you want to cognitive, yeah, cognitively remind yourself that you have enough. That you have enough so that you can relax. That you can relax. And relaxing means literally that your belly breathes slowly, deeply, and gently. That's how you know that you're relaxed, is if you're safe enough to allow your belly to breathe. And again, this is entirely a question of safety and abundance. Do you have enough to relax? Are you safe enough to relax? Can you let go of the habitual tightening of your stomach muscles? Can you relax for a moment? And you will do this when you feel comfortable enough to take slow, deep breaths into and out of your lower abdomen. Not your upper abdominal cavity, but your lower abdominal cavity, because that's where we hold so much fear and tension.
And then again, bring an image of someone you love to your mind's eye. And do what you can to feel the affection that you have for this person. Feel it as you sit. And just allow for a moment to relax into that feeling. And then let that go. Take a breath and just allow your eyes to open. And my suggestion is if you want to think about happiness, do so when you're quiet like this rather than adrenalize because this part of you will keep you a little more in touch with the ways that a little more genuine happiness would emerge. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Luskin. Great talk. Everybody have a great holiday. Happy New Year, and we'll see you in 2000.